This is the Cities Podcast. I'm Brianna Goldberg. It's a beautiful day. I'm jogging right next to an athlete who's holding the torch for the 2050 Pan Am Pair Pan Am Games. It's very exciting. 7,000 athletes coming into the city from 41 countries. It's a huge event. Twice the number of athletes from the Olympics in Vancouver, in fact. Not everyone's so happy about it. People have been complaining about HOV lane insanity. People have been complaining about streets being closed down. So I thought this was a really great time to dip back into the archives and grab some tape from the cutting room floor from my interview with Sean McAuliffe. He's an urban issues author for Spacing Magazine, Toronto Star. He's written a few books for Coach House books about the city. And he told me this great story about how he came to love the city of Toronto. So I thought in this time of pan am pessimism, what better time to go back, learn how to love a city again. So here we go. As the torch gets passed off from one athlete to another, here's Sean McAuliffe on how to love a city. I first got interested in cities growing up in Windsor, which is a city that is across the border and across the river from Detroit. And so we grew up looking at the Detroit skyline, metaphorically and literally. Detroit news stations came into our house and we subscribed to the Detroit Free Press and that sort of thing. And so we had this like really intimate view and relationship with Detroit, but we weren't really part of Detroit. We were a little bit detached from it. And I think watching Detroit from afar made me really fascinated with that place. I always wanted to go there. But also the fact that Detroit was kind of a city in, in this long crisis of, of slow and fast decay with these kind of weird, rich suburbs. Fascinating place. And watching it decline was kind of heartbreaking because you saw the greatness of Detroit and the people that live there and the culture that came from that place. And then kind of watching it kind of crumble was heartbreaking. It was kind of this real, watching a family member decline being next to Detroit made me fall in love with cities. And then as a Canadian kind of looking up the 401, Toronto always seemed like this almost Oz-like city, you know, kind of at the end of the road, shiny skyscrapers, streetcars, subways, decidedly not falling apart. Uh, so it was the opposite of Detroit. It was a city that was growing and, and had all these layers to it, human and otherwise. It had all the kind of infinite mystery that I think is appealing about the city. I moved here and got a job, a regular job that had nothing to do with urbanism, a real job, had benefits and things like that for a big nonprofit. But then on, on my lunch hour, the office was at Bayview in Eglinton. And so I just started exploring for an hour. Instead of going to the cafeteria and sitting, I would eat at my desk before and then go for a walk and, or go for a walk to Young and Eglinton. Um, started exploring that. And then on the weekends, I would go for long, like five or six hour walks from my apartment or house or take a subway somewhere and start going for walks. I realized when I got here in 2000, I thought I was moving to a city that I knew because there were many trips up in the 90s, visiting friends who went to U of T and otherwise, and you come up here for stuff sometimes. What I realized when I moved here, I really only knew a small slice of Toronto. I knew Young Street, because that's where you go when you are in late high school or early university. That is, is the destination. It's like the archetypal going down the road, that movie from 1971, something like that, with the two fellows from Nova Scotia. So it's kind of like you, you have to go to Young Street and walk it. Um, and then going to Queen West, because that was cool. And then maybe going to the Annex, because that's where U of T friends lived, and going to the Future Bakery. And so I got here and I realized I don't know where College Street went and I didn't know what was around the curve as Dundas curves away. And the city's vastness slowly became apparent. And so I started exploring it just on my own. And then I kind of slowly found other people who were into the city sort of in the same way, fascinated with it in the same way, and started poking around walking theory. And I found two things. One was a book that was published in 2000 by Rebecca Solnit, who is a writer from San Francisco. And she wrote a book called Wanderlust, The History of Walking. It became this kind of magical Bible. Um, it's like, oh, there's somebody else who is into this thing, this walking, and she wrote it so beautifully. So there's Wanderlust, and I kind of came across psychogeography as a concept. It was a way of walking around cities, exploring cities that was developed mostly in the 1960s by the situationists, radical Marxists in Paris, who did many things, but they did psychogeography, which was a method of breaking out of the modern cog in the machine kind of thing, way we go through the city without noticing anything. They had very different methods, grella methods of walking around cities. They would use a map of London 
and negotiate Paris. So intentionally trying to get lost. They would go on smell walks and, 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 and other things. The one thing that they did that I found really fascinating was this thing called the derive or the drift. And they would just drift through Paris. So it'd be like walking for the sake of walking with no destination in mind. And just whatever intersection or fork in the road or whatever you came to, whatever looked interesting, whatever looked like a mystery, you kind of follow it down. And that's how I realized I was walking in Toronto. I was just kind of walking. Psychogeography, I think, is a really fun way of approaching the city as an umbrella term because, I mean, it's, it's essentially about paying attention to space and the spaces you pass through and how those spaces make you feel. So the psychology and geography. Under that umbrella, you, you can pull in aesthetic issues, architecture, you can talk about urban planning, uh, but you can also just talk about uh, the kind of an emotional attachment. How does this place make you feel? What things have happened here? What is the social history of the place? Dip into the kind of archive of the historic things in there. So as a writer for the city, it's, I find a really kind of good, I don't know, intellectual approach using this theory with fuzzy boundaries. Sean McAuliffe writes for Spacing Magazine and the Toronto Star. He also authored The Trouble with Brunch and Stroll from Coach House Books. Sean also teaches a first-year course as part of the UC1 program at U of T. You can learn more about that by heading to news.utoronto.ca and just search his name, Sean McAuliffe. But I'll also link to the story where this podcast is found online. You can hear more about it in my first interview with Sean from the debut of this podcast. Find that in our back episodes. So now, in spite of the Pan Am-related grumpiness that's even been noted by the New York Times at this point, you are equipped to love the city once more, and I'm going to do you one better. I'm going to convince even the most pessimistic among you to get straight up excited about Pan Am. My office mate, Sarah Khan, is one of the people behind the voice of U of T's social media, but she's also one of the 23,000 Pan Am volunteers. That's the largest force of volunteers in Canada's peacetime history. Now, I think Pan Am is well and good, but I constantly ask her why she's offered to do this, to spend her spare time above her work hours, to helping to make the games run smoothly. I can't imagine being an awesome enough person to volunteer, but Sarah is legitimately excited about the games, and I'll let her explain why. It's, I don't know, it's, it's inspiring. Like, I volunteer for a lot of different things, and when I volunteer, I feel good. I make really good friends, and the people who volunteer with you are also very engaged in trying to make your community the best possible community. So it's a very good environment to be in. Last night I went to the rehearsal for the opening ceremony and Mike Clements, Pinball, he was talking about how all the volunteers, if you add up the number of hours they're doing, it's going to go back to like the 1800s. That's how much hours they're putting in. There's so many athletes and people volunteering from around the world and 20 different languages being spoken during the game. Like it's so much energy that it's just exciting. Thanks to Sarah and the 22,999 or so other volunteers for helping to realize this giant event transforming our city and the university. U of T is hosting a number of events at both the St. George and Scarborough campuses. Speaking of help, I could use yours. Give me a heads up about the stories you'd like to hear about on this podcast. Let me know if I should do more jogging intros. Just tweet with the hashtag U of T cities or send me an email at U of T news at utoronto.ca. And if you liked this podcast, just copy the link and share it on Facebook or Twitter or just tell a friend. I'd be grateful because the more people we invite into the city's podcast, the better I can produce stories that matter to you. Subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or follow us on SoundCloud. It's free and you'll receive new episodes as soon as they're available. Don't forget you can also go back and explore earlier episodes featuring Roman Mars from Radiotopia's design podcast, 99% Invisible. Last episode of the city's podcast featured Izzy Ritchie from the Strumbellas and music critic Ian Gormley. They made their case for how Toronto could be a much more music-friendly city. The podcast has also featured architects, poets, city councillors, and much more. Today, you heard music that friend of the podcast, Jay Ferguson, produced just for us. I also featured original music from Chris Magnuson. He's part of U of T's Masters of Music Composition program. This series is produced by me, Brianna Goldberg, with help from U of T news editor, Jennifer Lantier. Thanks for listening. And hey, enjoy the 2015 Pan Am Para Pan Am Games. <laughs>